All right, y'all turn to Romans chapter 3. We're going to take an opportunity tonight to deal with the, um, uh, not say a question, a uh, uh, debate type thing, I guess. Um, Romans 3. Now, we're going to look at something. I'll put a timeline up here. We're just going to take our time and we're just going to let the Bible say just exactly what it says. And we don't want to use any rules of, of, you know, you can't do this and you can't do that. Now, here's the cross. Prior to the cross, what did God give Israel? The law, right? In Romans, when you start the book of Romans, I'm just going to start here. What Paul does over here, when Paul writes Romans, we'll just put him over here. Here he's writing to the Romans. He gives, he goes all the way back. And starts dealing with mankind. In the first few verses he says, Hello, you know, here, I'm, I'm proud to hear about y'all and you're this and I'll be there and his intentions and whatnot. But then he jumps in and he starts declaring, he starts with the Gentiles, like, I mean, far back. The Gentiles who knew God, he says, but they glorified him not as God. Didn't Adam know God? Yep. Did his descendants know God? Mm -hmm. But over time, what did they do? They, they served other gods. So what did all mankind do back here? They all departed from God, didn't they? Okay. So Paul declares the entire bunch of them back there, Gentile pagans, all of them, guilty of sin, worthy of death. And all the Jews, I can hear them in Rome say, Amen, kill them, they're worthy of death, right? Then he gets on the Gentiles that are more moral than them, those that had some conscience and whatnot. And he declares... When you have done one thing contrary to your conscience, you commit, you're guilty, right? So then he gets all the rest of the Gentiles. Now, when he got the first group, the group of Gentiles here said, that, oh, huh, well, get them. The Jews said, amen. When he gets the second group here, I bet the Jews all stood up and applauded and said, amen. All Gentiles are sinners. And then Paul says, oh, but you Jews, you Jews that have the law. By breaking the law, you're guilty too, right? So what did Paul prove in the first three chapters of Romans? All under sin. All under sin. That's the proof. All under sin. Alright, so he's condemned the entire human race. Thank you. Alright, now, like a hinge uh, in the book... Romans 3.21 comes along. And all of a sudden, everything, we're at an all-time low. In verse 20, let's read verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, now that's just to say by a man's works, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. If the book ended right there, the suicide rate would be astronomical, wouldn't it? There's no hope for us. We're all guilty going to hell, no hope. But the next verse says, but now. Now when Paul says, but now, Paul divides all history into two periods of time. Now we know we have friends that divide it into 3 and 7 and 21, but Paul divides all history into two periods of time. Y'all know this is common in the whole world. I don't care where you live in the world today. Get out your checkbook and write a check, and what are you going to have to write on it up there at the top? you got to write the date, don't you? What year are you going to put? 2018. What are they indicating when they write that? What's that based on? Today they call it the CE, common error, because they don't want to say the year of our Lord, do they? But how is all, all everybody in the world has calendar and what's it? Based on the problem. It's based on the birth of Christ. Yes, based on Jesus Christ, isn't it? So we've got BC and we've got common error, as they say, or AD, right? Hey, by the way, if you were a Russian, you know, we say Sunday, and we get that from the pagans. It's a worship of the sun. All our days are named after that sort of stuff. But if I were a Russian, let's say I'm an atheist Russian, and I don't know anything about God. Every time I say Sunday in Russian, do you know what I have to say? Resurrection Day. That's what Sunday is for Russian. Resurrection Day. That's what their word is. Imagine that. An entire continent of Russians over there say resurrection. That's a pretty strong testimony to the resurrection, isn't it? Okay. So like that, Paul divides all time. Now I'm going to come over here and I'm going to put, but now. Now, but now is set in context to verse 30, or 20, the deeds of the law. 
So when Paul says, but now, when does Paul's period of time change? After the cross. After the cross. There is no extra period of time over here. Paul's not the first one to preach this thing. Paul's just writing here and he's saying, look, it used to be one way, but now. Now he says, but now, the righteousness of God. Now, what does righteousness actually mean? We, we talk about it all the time and it's like sometimes I think we, in our mind, we make it some kind of an imaginary thing that kind of, righteousness is very simple. It means always having been right. Never once having been wrong, perfectly correct. The word itself comes from a, a it means there's no crook. It's perfectly straight. You know, we got a guy, that, somebody is a, a, a con man, we call him a crook, don't we? Where did that ever come from? He's crooked. He's not straight. He won't deal straight with you. He's crooked, right? Well, righteousness is straight. So when it says, but now the righteousness of God, that means the very perfection of God. The righteousness of God. Now, who is the righteousness of God? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. If you want to know what righteousness looks like in the flesh, where do you look? Jesus Christ. So he says, now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. Now, how was righteousness manifested before the cross? We talked about this a little bit the other day. Did the law show perfect righteousness? Hey, the law said love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, didn't it? Mm -hmm. And your neighbor as yourself. If you could do that constantly, 100% of the time, guess what you would prove you were? Righteous. Righteous. If, for instance, if Moses' son would have said, Dad, what does perfection look like in the flesh? What would Moses have shown him? The law. He'd have said, look, it's like this. Do this, 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 right? But he said, now after the cross, and we come on this side, what's the opposite of law in the Bible? Grace. He says, but now, as opposed to back then, the righteousness of God is manifest without the law. Then look what he says next. Being witnessed by the law and prophets. This is what we want to talk about. All Paul is saying is this. Prior to the cross, a man looked for to see what righteousness in the flesh looked like by looking at the law. Only they did it from a means of, okay, how can I do this to attain something? And none of them ever could, could they? But after the cross, if someone asked you today, what is righteousness? Would you talk to them about Moses' law? What would you talk to them about? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. What, how is righteousness manifested today? Christ. Through Christ. But think about love God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Where did that take place at? On the cross. So today, if someone would ask me, what does perfect righteousness look like? I say, oh, it's easy. It looks like Jesus Christ died on the cross for his enemies, right? So then after over here, I don't take a man back to the law to show him how to try and act righteous. I tell a man about the one that acted righteous over here and tell him to believe on him, right? But look what he says now. The righteousness of God without the law is, present tense manifested, being witnessed. Now what tense is being witnessed? Present. present. Right then. Now look, Paul's writing over here about 25 years after the cross. Okay? All right, when Paul writes Romans, it's Acts chapter 20 when he's on the way, before he goes to Jerusalem when he writes Romans. He writes 2 Corinthians and Romans in a three-month period of time there. When Paul writes Romans, how much of the New Testament did Paul have? There was no such thing. Folks, Paul never read the book of John. Paul never read Revelation. He didn't have them. Now, what, what I want you to see is Paul goes out and Paul's preaching. Hadn't he been preaching for years now, hadn't he? But he ain't been preaching with a New Testament, has he? And yet in every city he goes to, where does he go to first? The synagogue, the Jews. Why start there? This, yeah, he's going to go to the Jew first. But think about common sense. Why? Look what he says in the verse. The righteousness of God without the law is manifest. Being witnessed. What does it mean, witnessed? Look at it, watch it. Yeah, well, uh, how about if I go to court and I'm a witness? i got to give testimony, don't I? Yeah. So then how was Paul showing people the gospel? 
being witnessed by the law and prophets. What did Paul have? The Old Testament. Y'all know, we, we, we know, look, we've all heard this idea that we're in the mystery period and he can't find it back here, right? We've been told that one. Well, if the mystery's not in the Old Testament, as they say, and look, they got the mystery so fouled up, but if what Paul was preaching was something brand new, how is he preaching it from the Old Testament Scriptures? See there, does that make any sense? Alright, if what Paul was preaching to the church, they say the church can't be found in the Old Testament. If there's nothing in the Old Testament that foreshadows the church, how was Paul preaching his message with the Old Testament Scriptures? It's all he had. Now let's prove this. Go over to, uh, uh, take it back up to Romans 1. All right, Romans 1.1. 1, 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God. Now look, I was taught that these are all different gospels, and, and I taught that. And, and luckily, I, or thankfully, the Lord started showing me, hey, if we just back up and just use common sense. If A equals B and B equals C, doesn't A equal C? Is Christ God? Then is the gospel of Christ the gospel of God? The Bible says Christ was God manifest in the flesh. Now it says, separated under the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the holy scriptures concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord. So then was it in the Old Testament scriptures? Now did the Jews see it? No. What was, but Christ was in the Old Testament scriptures. But when the Jew read the Old Testament scriptures, could he see Christ? See, the Jew had, how would we go about doing this? I'm going to write performance. Because when the Jew looked at the law, what did he think it was all about? Him doing, works. Him doing works to be righteous with God. They went about to establish their own righteousness through the Old Testament law, didn't they? And yet, while they were busy doing that performance, the whole time, what was hid in there? Jesus Christ. Did they see it? No. No. They couldn't see it. It was in veiled form. I'll just put Christ like this. And we talked the other day about the fact Paul said after the cross that since the Jew wouldn't believe Jesus was the Christ, when they read the Old Testament scriptures, still what was on their heart? A veil. So when a Jew after the scriptures an unbelieving Jew after the cross read the scriptures. He's still reading what he's got to do to try and get right with God, right? But what about a believing Jew? Paul could take those scriptures and show that Jew Christ on every page, couldn't he? Uh, a famous Old Testament or a famous old preacher said about the Old Testament: "Prick any verse in the Old Testament and it bleeds." Now that's true, because think about what Christ said. He told the the Jews. Search the scriptures, for in them you think that you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Testifies like witness, right? Now Paul said, after the cross, he was preaching the righteousness of God, being witnessed right here by the law and prophets. Does that make sense so far? All right, flip back to Acts chapter 9. Let's just take a look at what he's doing and see if it makes sense. If we'll give up all those rules of thumb and all everything all of a sudden starts to fall into place and the Bible gets a whole lot easier to make sense of when we don't have it all split into sections. Boy, that cinnamon stick. It's good. You should put you one in there, Chris. It's good. <laughs> all right. We know the story Paul uh, gets saved. He's on the road to Damascus. The Lord appears to him. He receives his sight after three days, and we're going to pick up in verse 20, Acts 9, 20. Straightway he preached Christ in the synagogue that he is the Son of God. So did Paul prove to these, or did he preach to these people that Christ is the Son of God? He did, right? But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? But Saul increased the more in strength. Do y'all think that's physical strength? In the Word. In the Word. Yeah. Folks, he's, he's like eating spiritual bread, so he's spiritually growing, isn't he? And he confounded. What's confounded mean? Confused. 
Yeah, he got them. He ever, no way. Yeah, you ever got somebody, uh, seen somebody got so tongue-tied they couldn't? Yeah. Yeah. He confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving, now how do you prove something? With witnesses, don't you? You go to court, you're going to prove something, you've got to have some witnesses. He said, proving that this is very Christ. That's old English for verifiable, of a certainty. In other words, how in the world did Paul prove to the Jews that Christ is the Son of God? Well, what did he have to prove with? All the witnesses from the Old Testament. He's got all the Old Testament witnesses, that's right. I mean, how could you prove anything to a Jew in a synagogue? He, he believes the Scriptures, doesn't he? You know, there's a... All right, first off, if we go back then, how many people could read and write back then? And not many, right? He, you know, this still goes on today in the Middle East in uh, mosques and stuff. You can, you can hear people talking about this. Most of the people in the Middle East, the common people, they don't, they don't read and write. But if they go into their mosque, the mosque is open all day, and they got their Koran sitting up there, and people come into the mosque and sit down on their carpet, and they start waiting, doing their prayers along there, waiting. You know what they're waiting for? Somebody to come along that can read. So when someone comes in, this is how they do it today. Y'all research it and look. When someone comes along during the, you know, during the day that can read, he gets up there and he reads from the scriptures and they all listen. That's the way they get to hear their, right? Well, this is what the Jews did. It's the same thing. So when Paul comes into the synagogue, he's got a bunch of them sitting there. Could Paul read and write? Folks, Paul's highly educated. Paul got up there and started reading. I mean, have you ever thought, do you think he went into the synagogue and it was a Sabbath day and the people at the preacher in the synagogue said, well, I'm just going to let you have it today, son. You take it. Y'all know it didn't happen like that. Paul went in there and stood up to read. Look, I'll show you an example of this. Hold back. Go back to Luke 4. Luke 4, 16. You know, a man that could read and write back then was very valuable to a group of people, wasn't he? We, uh, today, we take, I shouldn't say we, I take the, the whole idea of preaching today. A lot of times we take it for granted. But imagine how important the preacher was when in America people couldn't read and write. It's very important to have a guy that's, you know, going to teach you the Word of God sincerely. All right, in chapter 4, verse 16. And he, Jesus, came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. Now just think about it for a second. Why on earth would they let this man stand up there and read? Because this is how they did. When that service was over, folks, that Old Testament scripture stayed there. And all the people would come in and sit down. And when somebody come along that could read, they got a taste of the word of God. This is how they got it. Now, when Jesus stands up to read, y'all remember what they said later, uh, Verse uh, 22, all bear witness and wondered at the gracious words were proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is not this Jesus' son or Joseph's son? Remember they said in another place, how is it you can, you're lettered? How can you read and write? He was just a common folk, wasn't he? But when he went in there, did he have any problem getting up there to read? Mm -hmm. he, we got the same tradition. There's so many traditions tied up in different religions today that come from this sort of stuff, but it's gotten masked. I'll give you one that's just, we're going to all understand this one. Dina won't, or Lexi won't, me, Chris, and Lonnie will understand it. My mom is a reader at Mass. My mom was too. She was too. That's a big uh, pat on the back, isn't it? It's like a feather in your cap. What she would do is get up from, from at the beginning of Mass and walk up there and open up that book and read one verse from the Bible. Say, this is a reading from such and such. Close the book and go sit down. Mm -hmm. You know, I reckon that tradition come from? It's the same tradition. Did we discuss that verse in Catholic Church? No. Did, was it ever brought up again? Mm -hmm. it, it not only gave her the thrill of doing it and it involved the laity, so to speak, but it also gave the appearance that we're still, we, we're, we're, we go by the Bible. Mm -hmm. Right? The priest carried it. He never looked at it, but they carried it down there. So then the reading like that, that's the same custom here. So when Paul goes into the synagogue, imagine Paul getting up, reading from Isaiah 53, for instance, and saying he was led as a, as a lamb to the slaughter. And then said, folks, I want to let y'all know something. This prophecy has been fulfilled. Jesus of Nazareth that y'all heard about, he is the man. Now what would happen when he said that? Look out. 
They're going to be wanting to kill him, aren't they? But the first thing, they couldn't just kill him. Number one, he's a Roman citizen. And number two, he's a Jew. They couldn't just, you know, t take him and kill him. So then what would happen? What would begin to happen in the uh, synagogue, do you think? Grumbling. Grumbling. And then the next thing you know, somebody's going to stand up. Heretic, right? right? And to which Paul could say, heretic, would you mind opening, come up here and show me in the scriptures? Watch how he did it. Flip over to Acts, uh, oh, let's see, 17. Acts 17, 1. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was the synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, then is this, can we learn in this passage what he did each time? as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. So for three Sabbath days, he goes in there and uses the Old Testament Scriptures, doesn't he? Now, if you can't mix mystery and prophecy, as they say, how's Paul doing this? Don't make any sense, does it? There are those that say, well, it was up and this was before Acts 28. And after Acts 28, it changed. I defy you to show me a single scripture that says anything like that. Now, verse 3. Opening and alleging. What is he opening? Old Testament scriptures. Opening and alleging that Christ must, needs, have suffered. If you're going to prove that Christ had to suffer, what are you going to prove? People say the gospel wasn't preached in the, in the Old Testament. Look, if you prove that Christ had to suffer and die, then what are you going to have to prove? That all men are sinners and need a Savior, aren't you? And then who are you going to prove as the Savior? Christ. And where is he doing this from? The Old Testament Scriptures. Folks, this is all Paul's doing in the book of Romans. Y'all think about Romans. Over 80 times, Paul quotes flat out, says it is written or as it is written in the book of Romans. Did he say in the book of Romans, there is none righteous, no, not one? Mm -hmm. Where did he get that from? Book of Psalms. Did he say there are none that doeth good? Mm -hmm. He got it straight out from David, didn't he? Yeah. He went from Old Testament quote to Old Testament quote in the book of Romans doing what? Proving the gospel. This is what he was doing. Now he says... Opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead. How in the world could he preach resurrection from the Old Testament scriptures? How could he preach the resurrection of Christ? People say that it's not back there. Then they'll go so far and say, yeah, but we've got the rapture and it's not back there. I'm going to show you all in a minute the whole ball of wax is back there. How in the world could he preach Christ resurrected from the Old Testament scriptures? Watch Jesus do it. Flip over to uh, Matthew 12. A lot of those in Psalms. Yeah, Psalms, a bunch of it. Yeah. Psalm 16 said, He'll not leave my soul in hell. Huh? Right. All right? It, I mean, literally, there are tons of ways you could just think of the simplest way. The Jews worshipped Abraham, didn't they? All you'd have to do is say, How long did God promise that land to Abraham? Forever. Well, hold on a second. How old is Abraham going to live to be? Right? right? Well, then how's Abraham going to have the land forever in his flesh? He ain't, is he? Then what did Abraham believe? There's a future. He believed there's a future. There's life after death, isn't there? Right. Mm -hmm. Now, watch. Here's just one way. You could do this all kind of ways. Verse 38. Matthew 12, 38 says, Then certain of the scribes and the Pharisees, Oh, here come Dr. So-and-so and, you know, DD and DDS and all that up, you know what I mean. They answered saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. By the way, you watch it when people call Jesus Master in Scripture. Beware, watch what, who, who calls him that. They want to see a sign from thee. You know, people say, well, maybe they were wanting to believe. You know, people will go anywhere today to see something, won't they? I got a family member that goes up somewhere around uh, your area of North Georgia up there where Mary's supposed to appear in the sky. I don't know where that's at. There's a big old thing up there to see it. I mean, look, you say, hey, so-and-so is going to, uh, 
I'm trying to think. If my next door neighbor decided he was going to jump the lake out there in his car, I'd walk out there and see it, wouldn't y'all? Yeah. yeah, I'm going to see this. So they want to see a sign. Verse 39. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. Now that's a pretty condemning statement for people today that are looking for signs, isn't it? If a man's looking for a sign, what is he refusing? Faith. He won't walk by faith. Yeah. He won't believe it because God said it. He's saying, God, you said it, but I don't really believe it until you show it to me. And that's, that's harsh, isn't it? It says, there shall no sign be given to him. By the way, what does a sign mean? Isn't a sign like a symbol? We got a stop sign out here, right? I don't. Every time you pull up to a stop sign, do you read S T? Do you stop? We don't. What do you know when you see the sign? The shape is red. You know the shape is red. <coughs> People that cannot read and write know stop sign, don't they? He, we were watching Andy Griffith the other night. Y'all get sick of here. That's all I'm watching. Love Andy. Yeah, but we were watching Andy Griffith, the one where Ernest T. Bass was on there, and he wanted to learn to read so he could get his girlfriend impress her. On, was it Hall yet? No. Hall yet. <laughs> The one that he threw the rock at and hit her right there. The taxiderma sewed up her head. <laughs> Any, but Andy said, well, you can't read. And he opened up a book. He said, oh, I can read that. No trespassing. He said, you can read. He said, no trespassing. No hunting, no fishing, no trespassing. Could he read? He just knew what those signs looked like, didn't he? Well, a sign is a symbol that declares something, right? Is that sign actually the action or is it just declaring the action? It's just declaring the action. Now watch, it says, There shall no sign be given it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. Then was there a sign in the book of Jonah? But did Israel see the sign? Folks, if they'd seen the sign, they would have seen the Messiah. They missed the stop sign, so they blew right through the four-way stop, didn't they? He said, For... As Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Then could you preach resurrection from the book of Jonah? Mm -hmm. You know, if a Jew had a, had, a, had a sincere heart and saw himself as he's sitting in a synagogue, let's say we're in a synagogue here and everybody in here is all just, we're, we're all just uh, Pharisees, self-righteous Jewish Pharisees, but Chris is sitting over there in the back row and he's come to the point where he's getting honest with himself. He's saying, you know something? This is all a farce. That guy's standing up there acting holier than thou and I happen to know that he's fooling around with my next door neighbor and, and this and that. This is all just a skin. This is all, y'all know you get to a point where you feel like that about religion. This is all just a, a shame, right? Chris is admits that I can't do this. Man, to me keeping this law is ridiculous. I can't do this. And Paul stands up and preaches from Jonah. Chris's heart is in a contrite position, isn't it? God opens his heart up, and as Paul's preaching from Jonah, Chris stands up and said, I can't believe it. That's why that story's in our scripture. And you'd say, well, what do you mean? Look, all my life I've been reading this and wondering why is this in the Word of God? A man swallowed by a fish? That don't make any sense. That's like a tall tale, right? But when he preached Jesus Christ from the scriptures, what happened? The person that had the contrite heart could see it, couldn't they? So then how did Paul preach the gospel of Christ all during his ministry? Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. I mean, imagine a man over here saying, Paul, how can, I mean, what is Jesus Christ? I mean, how can this virgin birth? I mean, y'all are telling me that the man was born of a virgin. Could Paul go to Isaiah chapter 7 and show it? It says right there, a virgin shall conceive, huh? He could then go all the way back to Genesis and say, look at this first promise, the seed of the woman. Now, Israel thought they were the seed of the woman, didn't they? They're actually the woman and Christ is the seed. So Paul could go all through the Old Testament scriptures preaching Christ, couldn't he? Now, go to Acts chapter 26. You know, I've been just, uh, just blessed because they're... Okay, tons of people uh, called me everything under the sun and then took off and I never got to talk to them again. But in every place, there's a little group, a few here and a few there that saw and, and that further light came and said, okay, yeah, we got some stuff wrong and started coming out of it. And uh, one of them is, uh, you remember John Hampton that came with the big St. Bernard? 
from Idaho. John Hampton told me that this verse right here that I'm fixing to read stuck in his crawl and he couldn't do nothing with it. He said every time he would, you know, get down with right division and he said he would do all this and he said, but this verse just kept sticking in his crawl. He couldn't do anything with it. Well, watch, you'll see why. Jesus has, uh, has appeared to Paul. Paul's telling the story. He's before Agrippa. Verse 19, Paul says, Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus, and at Jerusalem, and throughout all the coast of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. We're going to do some classes on what it really means to repent soon, because, okay, we've got this thing about now. If you'll repent of your sins, then you can be saved. And there ain't a lick of truth to that. That means you've got to turn from some sin to be worthy to be saved. But like, like cows, that you scare a cow in a field, and that cow runs slap to the other side of the field. They always go too far with it. And recognizing that was wrong, we run too far with it, and we say repent means just to change your mind. But it doesn't mean just, is a change of mind involved? Yeah, many times it's a change of mind involved. But I'll give you all an example. The Bible says about 82 times, I think it is, that God repented. Did God ever have a change of mind? You don't think about that for a second. Did God ever decide, I'm going to do this, and then later say, no, I changed my mind, I'll do this? How could God change his mind when God knows all things? He knows the beginning from the end, right? His plan is from the beginning, this eternal plan of salvation. Then for you to say that God was about to do this and then something happened and he said, well, I guess I won't do that. Now I guess I'll go do this. See, repent is to change course. Now when we human beings repent, most of the time we've got to change our thinking, right? We do as we think. But when God changes courses, it's nothing more than like the military about face. Y'all know what about face means? All right, you'll see God going in one direction and then guess what? About face. But does that mean he didn't know he was going to do that? Sure, he knew he was going to do it. He didn't change his mind. He, when I was on the submarine, you, you drive along so long, uh, just going four knots to nowhere, 400 feet deep and going four knots to nowhere. All you're doing is hiding out there in case you got to launch missiles, right? And you've got this uh, long towed array behind you, but you can't hear behind you because of the screw. So about every so often, guess what you do? It's planned. It's laid out ahead of time. About every so often you turn, it's a zigzag. You turn this way so you can listen behind you, and you turn that way. It's called a zigzag. Whenever you zigzag, you know what they tell the guy? Left full rudder, right full rudder, change direction, right? But does that mean that the guy driving the boat changed his mind and wanted to go in the other direction? It's a change of direction, but it's a planned change of direction, isn't it? Purpose. It's a purpose. It's known before time. Folks, God never learned anything. If me and you believe God the Father ever had a moment when he learned something, what did that say about him before? He wasn't, he wasn't perfect. He ain't God. Okay, so God never changed his mind like that. Did God show that he was about to act in one manner based on men's actions? And when uh, something happened, God would change directions. But it's not that God changed, oh, I was going to get them all. You know, it ain't like that. It's all according to his purpose. So we're going to look at that soon. And that, he, Randall Hartman had brought up some things about that a while back. And he made some real good points of it. But anyway, let's move on. He, he showed them they need to do works meet for repentance. For these causes, the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day. So when he says, I continue unto this day, he's talking about from the beginning of his ministry until now, right? He just laid it out all through his ministry. Witnessing, there's our word, testifying. Witnessing both to the small and the great. Saying, this is John Hampton's verse that he couldn't get past. Saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. Did Paul say a single word that disagreed with the Old Testament? What Paul did was expound on the Old Testament, didn't he? You know, we've got the book of Hebrews. We started it uh, Friday night in Montgomery. We started it, and I told him we ought to be able to get through it in about 12 years. If you look down here, over here, we've got the book of Hebrews. At the end of our books. Hebrews is nothing more than a commentary on the Old Testament Scripture. 
I mean, you start in the very first thing in Hebrews, it says God, who at sundry times in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son, whom He created the worlds by. Mm -hmm. Then what's the first thing the writer of Hebrews is addressing? Genesis chapter 1. And what did he tell him Genesis chapter 1 is all about? Christ. Jesus Christ is the one that created the worlds. And he goes right down through the Old Testament Scripture, doesn't he, in the book of Hebrews. He gets on Melchizedek. It says Melchizedek's a type of a priesthood belonging to Christ, didn't he? He says Abraham, type of Christ. How about the mercy seat? Christ. How about the tabernacle? Christ. How about the sin offering? Christ. How about everything back here is pointing to who? To Christ. Now the Jews couldn't see that, could they? But once a person believed over here, could they begin to see it? And who's the man that's going about explaining it? Folks, it's Paul. Now the other apostles are, are beginning to understand this, but where did they get their clear understanding that the law was done away? They got it from Paul, folks. Y'all remember when, when God desired Peter, it was time, the three and a half years after the cross came to an end, it's, it was prophesied, it's time for Peter to go to a Gentile, and what did God have to do to get him to go to Cornelius? He had to give him a vision three times, didn't he? I mean, you talk about hard-headed. He then says, Peter, rise and eat. And Peter said, not so, Lord. I've never eaten anything that's common or unclean. And what did Peter think? He's still under the law, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Peter finally realizes, okay, this, I guess this is from the Lord because they knock on his door to Gentiles and they say, come. He gets down there to Cornelius' house. He walks in the door and said, hallelujah, the law is done. Is that what he said? Mm -hmm. He said, it is an unlawful thing for a man that's a Jew to be in here. Peter still thought he was under the law, didn't he? He later understands when Paul goes and communicates the message about the law to him, he understands how Paul's out preaching what he's preaching, that the law is done. Then immediately next, he goes to Antioch, where Paul's people are, and he's eating with the Gentiles, isn't he? But when some Jews come from the church in Jerusalem, what did Peter do? He separated and started making the division again. Y'all remember what Paul said? He got on him, didn't he? He threw him under the bus in front of all his Jewish friends. And then Paul said, If I build again the thing which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Was Paul finished with the law for righteousness? Yep. He said Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes, right? So when Paul said to Peter, If I, not we, if I build again the thing which I destroy, like resurrect something. What was Paul talking about resurrecting? The law. He said, if I resurrect the law, I make myself a sinner. Because who can keep the law? Keep one point? What do you have to keep? All of it. And what was Peter doing? He was raising a point of it, wasn't he? These men that get up in front of a congregation today and preach Old Testament tithing to them. You know what they're doing? Resurrecting the law. They're putting in people under a system of do it or else. Is there any reward for a person that gives anything, time, money, anything, in the name of God out of fear and legalism? Won't produce a thing at the judgment seat of Christ. Not one thing. I'll show you all an example of this. Alright? By the way, a tithe. Was a tithe 10% of anybody's uh, gross income? Never was. A tithe was a 10% of the increase. And we ain't talking money. Look, a tithe was... All right. It, they had... Let me draw up here. They had 12 tribes. In all reality, they had 13 because of Joseph's kids. But they had 12 tribes, right? They're all supposed to be a holy priesthood. But what did they do right there when they're given the covenant? They, they make a golden calf. God said, stand back, Moses, Right? Moses steps in as a type of Christ. God, uh, God turns from his purpose. And then God says, Moses, tell them, see who's on your side. Remember the story? And Moses said, everybody that's with me and the Lord come over here. And one tribe went over there, didn't they? Who was it? The Levites. So the Levites break away in there with Moses, aren't they? And therefore, who became the priest? The Levites instead of the whole nation. So now you've got 11 common tribes and one tribe of ministers, I'm going to say, because that's a servant. Now all the Levites weren't priests, but all of them had a job to do. Carrying the tabernacle, erecting the tabernacle, they all had work to do, right? 
Since the Levites had that work to do, could they have a day job or a night job? Could the Levite own any property? So what's the Levite going to eat? God tells the other 11 tribes, they're working on your behalf for me, so you give them a tenth of the increase of your crops and your animals. Does that make sense? The increase. If I'm a man from Issachar, and I've got 100 sheep at the beginning of the year, at the end of the year, I've got 110 sheep. What's my increase? Ten. The preachers today say, you owe me a tenth of the 110, don't they? Actually, you owe a, they would owe one sheep, wouldn't they? Now, when they bring that sheep to the Levite, the priest, the priest takes the sheep. Let's say uh, Bentley brings me a sheep. Lonnie brings a sheep. I'm the, I'm the Levite priest. Everybody brings a sheep. Dina brings the most gorgeous little perfect lamb, right? Thing is just perfect. Chris brings one that's got a broke leg, okay? Bentley over there got, brings one that he shot at a deer and hit the hit the sheep and brings it in there. It's half mangled, but it's still breathing. What was the Levite priest supposed to do immediately? Who's he owe a tithe to? To God. What's he supposed to give God? The best. The, one without, the best of what he has. Now, if the best he has has a blemish, he can still offer. This is not the sin or the pet Passover. But he's supposed to give the best to God and him and his family eat the rest and survive, right? In Malachi, guess what the writer of Malachi says to the priests? He said, and now I speak to ye priests. And then he says, ye have robbed God. Yeah. And these men stand up behind pulpits today and preach that to the congregation. They're the ones robbing God. Mm -hmm. They take all the people's money and what do they do with the best of it? New car, new, new suits. new. Hey, I mean, look, they look out for number one and they don't have any. Y'all know what tithe was supposed to be? For the fatherless, for the widows, for the poor and the stranger. Is that what they carry him up for? So when he writes in Malachi that they had robbed the robbed God, who had robbed God? The priest. Because what did the priest offer to God? The one Bentley brought. He looked through him and said, well, we just, this one ain't much use. Let's give him this one. Mm -hmm. Y'all know me and you do about the same thing with our time a lot of times with God? If you think about it. They had an old preacher who was telling a story one time. He said, there was a, a young girl who uh, belonged to a, a church up northeast. And he said, one day somebody knocked on the young girl. This was in the 20s. And said, a guy knocked on the door and delivered her some flowers. So he said she got the flowers out and opened them up. And said it was a dozen red roses about a month old. They were just wilted and, you know, how they just looked horrible. And she thought, what in the world? This is a true story. And said she looked in the card and were from a, a lady, her Sunday school teacher, a lady at her church, real nice little old lady, right? And said she thought, huh, she must have sent me these a long time ago and they forgot to deliver them or something. So she set them in there, was kind of confused. They looked horrible. Anyway, that Sunday she saw the lady and she said, uh, I got the flowers you sent me, you know? And the lady said, oh, great. I just, I hope you enjoy them. They were the most beautiful flowers. She said, well, I'm a little confused. She said, confused why? She said, ma'am, you might not know it, but those flowers you sent me are just about practically completely dead. They're just all dried out and withered. She said, oh no, honey, I know. She said, well, why would you do that? She said, last Tuesday night, me and whatever her husband's name, she said, we were going down to the dime store to pick some stuff up and I heard some girls around the corner talking, just talking together. And I heard a, a, just, a just a wonderful young lady say, you know, I want to be a Christian and I want to serve God, but I'm young now and I want to have some fun and all. I'm going to wait till I'm older to get serious about, you know, serving the Lord. And that girl hung her head. She said, yes, ma'am. I said that. That was me. She said, I know, honey. She said, now look at you today. So wonderful and beautiful. And what you're wanting to do is like me giving you those flowers. You're wanting to take the best for yourself. And when you're all withered and dried up, say, God, you can have what's left. Now, that's about the same way we do with time and our efforts and stuff. We want the best for ourselves. It, me and you should never let anybody put us under a tithe or any obligation of do it or else. Everything we own, everything we have, guess who it belongs to? God. It, we don't owe God a tenth. We owe God ten tenths. I'm, look, get your mind off money. For Money is what everybody makes it about. How much of, how many of my breaths when I breathe do I take of the Lord's air? It's all His, isn't it? 
I mean, Paul said that if a man believes Christ died for all, then they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him that died for them. Folks, it all belongs to God, doesn't it? All my time, all my thoughts. Now, I'm not telling you I, I've done this or I ever will do this, but is this not what the goal is? I mean, look, we're supposed to be serving the Lord with all our heart, aren't we? But what happened back here is these Levites took the best and got fat and rich with them, didn't they? Now, how about a Creflo Dollar? Joel Osteen, man, we see this all the time, don't we? Mm -hmm. Me and Lexi cannot go down Spring Hill Avenue, I promise y'all, it seems like, without seeing a Mercedes or a BMW with Pastor G or Pastor T on the tail. We see it all the time, don't we? What's that about? I mean, look, if the man can afford a Mercedes or that, that's fine, but why have the personalized pastor tag? What's he saying? Yeah. Y'all know what he's saying. Matter of fact, we saw one not long ago. We saw one not long ago that said blessed. That's what the tag said. B-L-E-S-S-S-S-D. Blessed. Right? What's that person really saying? Why is he so blessed and the guy in the lane next to him isn't? Because he's God's man. He's special, isn't he? Is, does he claim that he has special prominence in the eyes of God? It's what he's claiming. Now, y'all look at this man, Paul. When Paul went out, do you ever see Paul doing anything? Does he ever once mention tithing? Why not? Because tithing's law. Right. See, look, law carries a penalty, all right? Think of a law. The inter the, did I get on the interstate? It says 70. That's a law, right? I want to go 90 on the interstate. If I could, that's what I would do. 90, 92. Get where I'm going, right? Like Dina. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I want to do 90. Now, what keeps me from doing 90? You don't want a ticket. I don't want a ticket. Every law has a penalty. In other words, it's do it or else, isn't it? Or else you pay the fine. Well, how in the world is that doing anything out of love? Everything under the law was what? Do it or else. Folks, it was give 10% to them, give the tenth of the increase to them, or you're breaking the law, right? Well, the man tells you over here today, you got to give 10% or you're robbing God. What's he putting you back under? The law. The law. Now, y'all go to Galatians 5. Do it or your washing machine breaks. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's their... <laughs> you got to bring your W-2 into some of these churches. I know it. And you can't enter the church until you... Hey, they're seriously there. They will make you have your tax thing and all. It. It's, un it's unbelievable. And then an auto debit. Right out of your account. Oh, yeah, hey, that. remember Keith said he had a family member that the church was auto-debiting her account? She died, and I guess he was the handler of the account, and it took six months to get him to quit drafting the account. Hey, I mean, this is crazy. Now watch what Paul says here. Verse 5, Galatians 5, 1. Chapter 5, verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty. What's liberty mean? Freedom. Freedom. In the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Now, what's the yoke of bondage? The law. The law. Now, watch what he says next. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. I don't mean you, you a saved man, couldn't get circumcised in, in thinking Judaism. Not Look, that doesn't say what it means. What it means is, what's Christ going to give you for it? If you go do one point of the law out of legalism, what reward is there? Nothing. Nothing. So if you give one dime to, to a church and you do it out of fear or legalism or scared you're going to be ex excommunicated or you wash your breakdown, you're doing it out of fear, aren't you? Then at the judgment seat of Christ, if you're saved, what reward will it produce? Nothing. It's got nothing that goes along with it. Paul said, God loveth a cheerful giver. Look, if I go anything with your time, if you get up and come to Bible study, and you oh, God, i got to go, or, you know, I've got to go. Y'all, I've been like that many times. It'd be Sunday mornings, I'd get up, we'd drive from Spanish Fort to Pascagoula, and I think I don't want to feel like going, up, you know, but I was legalistic. Yeah. Had to be there when the doors are open. If you did, you missed two times in a row, you get a phone call, right? Yeah. So then, but you see the idea there, that's legalism, isn't it? Now Paul says next, verse 3, I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Now just, he's using circumcision just in, you could plug any law in there, it doesn't matter. 
If you keep one law, you've resurrected the law, now what do you got to keep? All of it. All of it. Mm -hmm. What's Christ going to profit you for any of that? Isn't tithing a law? Yeah. Tithing comes right out of the book of Leviticus and Numbers. So if I resurrect tithing, standing behind a pulpit, am I putting the people under the law? True. Then what am I requiring that they have to do? Keep the whole law. And you know what they put themselves under? A curse. Yeah. Now those that are saved have just done like the Philippians they, or the Galatians, they've fallen from grace. They'd never be unsaved. But what about the unsaved people in the church that get that legalism? They'll never see Christ crucified on their behalf. They'll be blinded by their performance. <clears throat> he says again in verse 4, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever you are justified by the law, you're fallen from grace. I'll give you all an example of this. Go over to Philemon. Right before Hebrews 1. He, we read something out of Philemon last night at Ralph's and Ralph couldn't find it to save his life. And ain't that Ralph don't know his Bible. He flipped and said, oh, Hebrews, too far. He flipped back the other way. Oh, Titus, too far. Hebrews, too far. Titus, and I kept watching him like that. He's got a fairly new Bible. We got a, a big print. And you know the pages stick together? And I was watching him. He was getting aggravated going back and forth. He said, I can't find it. You know, he knew it was there. This one little old set of pages. That, all right, Philemon is a very simple story, but it's a wonderful story. Philemon is the man Paul's writing to. But Paul is in prison. And Paul is in prison in Rome, and he meets a man named Onesimus. Onesimus is an escaped slave, a Greek slave, right? Now remember, half the Roman Empire were slaves. They conquered a place, they made common people slaves. So Paul meets this slave named Onesimus. Onesimus tells him, well, I'm in here, I'm an escaped slave. I run away. Okay? He, he run away from the man that bought him. That's stealing from the man that bought him. So he ran away, he gets in prison, and Paul meets him. What do you suppose Paul wants to do when he meets him? Preach Jesus, Preach Jesus Christ to him. So Paul does that. Now look what it says in verse 10. I beseech thee, Philemon, for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. Then Paul preached the gospel, and the man was begotten again, wasn't he? So now here's this slave, this escaped slave, and he's now a free uh, person in Christ, isn't he? But he still, and legalistically, he still belongs to Philemon. Philemon's his owner. But guess who happens to know Philemon too? Paul. Guess who happened to preach the gospel to Philemon? Paul. So here's Paul, and he even says at one point, I'm doing this as Paul the age. In other words, look, I'm a wise old bird now, and I know how to handle this. He sends Onesimus back to Philemon. Now imagine you're an escaped slave. You've ran away. you cost this man money. And Paul tells you, go back home. Now you talk about acting in faith. Though Onesimus is acting in faith, didn't he? Paul writes this letter right here, folds it up, gives it to Onesimus and says, go home. And Onesimus probably said, what? And Paul probably said, look, Onesimus, you trust the Lord. But watch why Paul sent him home. Verse 11. He's, he's, verse 10, we'll read it together. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me. By the way, Paul divides all time into but now and time past. He does it several times. Now what I want to show y'all is that this is more than just a dispensational word as they say. Don't get, stuck up on, don't get stuck on that. Just look at the two periods of time. He said, Onesimus in time past was unprofitable to you, but now is profitable to me and you. Well, what changed? What was the but now moment for Onesimus? Saved. He got saved. Look at me and you. All of us had time past in our life, didn't we? How did you try to go to heaven most of your life? Acts of Acts of works. We all tried to perform, didn't we? So we all had time pass the moment we got saved, didn't we? And the moment you got saved was your but now moment, isn't it? And where did your but now moment take place at? At the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light, right? Yeah. So every believer has time pass legalism, but now the grace of Christ. Now all times divided this way. Now he says verse 12. Whom, Onesimus, I have sent again. Thou therefore receive him, that is, mine own bowels, my own offspring. 
whom I would have retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. So Paul says to this man, look, I'm sending him back to you. I would prefer to have kept him here, helping me. Matter of fact, he could have helped me in your stead. In other words, you're over there, you, you're not helping me, and he ain't making a point of that. He said, but this man's right here, and he's of use to me, and I would prefer to keep him right here, helping me with the gospel. He says, verse 14, but without thy mind, in other words, without your decision, would I do nothing. Now, Paul could have just told Onesimus, you stay right here, it's right in the Lord, but he didn't do that. Watch what he says next. In order that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. You see what Paul's doing? Paul said, look, I can use this man in my ministry. He's helpful to me. Now, he belongs to you. I'd like to keep him here. But if I just keep him here at the judgment seat of Christ, what will it do for Philemon? Nothing. Philemon just lost him. And hey, if Philemon could get him, he'd take him back, wouldn't he? But by sending this man back with this letter, what did Paul give Philemon the opportunity to do? He gave him the opportunity to say, Onesimus, head right on back and help Paul. Yeah. And when he gets back and helps Paul, everything he does in the Lord, guess whose accounts right along with him? Philemon's. See, Paul was giving Philemon an opportunity to do this thing willingly. Remember what Paul said about preaching the gospel? He flipped back to 1 Corinthians. I mean, Y'all hold Philemon, we'll come right back. Flip back to 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians 9, 16. All right, 1 Corinthians 9, 16, Paul says, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Could Paul possibly quit preaching the gospel? Somebody said, well, the Lord wouldn't let him. That ain't the point. Mm -hmm. The point is Paul knew the truth and he couldn't, hey, he couldn't stop. He was, he's got to do it. Now he says, verse 17, for if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensing of the gospel or a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. If Paul does it willingly, he gets a reward. If Onesimus goes back to Rome by Philemon's desire, Philemon gets rewarded for it, doesn't he? See, Paul was giving Philemon an opportunity to, to, uh, to be defrauded, to give something up for the Lord, to serve for the Lord. He's going to give his slave over to help Paul. Does that make sense? Now watch what he says back in Philemon. Remember, Philemon was in time past unprofitable unto him. Now verse 15 says, for perhaps he therefore departed for a season. In other words, when he escaped, that thou shouldest receive him forever, not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved. Now y'all think of the picture. This is wonderful. Was Philemon a man, a slave? He departed for a season, right? I got Adam back here. Folks, Adam was living in the garden in just a total beauty, a form of righteousness, not the righteousness of Christ, but a form of righteousness and a form of innocence that was wonderful. How long was Adam going to live? Well, at least a thousand years, based on other things in the scripture. He might have lived forever, I don't know, but where would he have lived at? Right there in the garden. He had a, he had a form of, of God-made human righteousness, didn't he? But what did he do? He fell. Did he depart from God for a season in order that what? He might be received back as a son. Think about it. This is the story of, of man. Did God know Adam was going to sin? Yep. Did God allow it? Mm -hmm. God didn't want Adam to just have the garden and the earth. God wanted the Adam, and God wanted Adam to have God. I mean, think about me and you. We departed in sin, but when we get saved, what are we? We're made children of God. Yeah. Folks, you and I aren't restored from a fallen position back to the righteousness of Adam. You and I are restored to the righteousness of God. Adam never had that. Right. If Adam had the righteousness of God, he wouldn't have rebelled. Would he? Mm -hmm. Would Adam have ever ate from the tree if he was as righteous as God? 
Then look what the Lord's done for us. The Lord allowed man to fall in order that the Lord could lift man up and give him a double portion. This is the story with Philemon. He left as a servant, he told Philemon, or Onesimus, uh, he says, when he gets back, Philemon, you don't treat him like a servant anymore. You treat him like a brother. Now think about the Lord Jesus Christ. We're sinners. We and you, where did he go to hell? There ain't no good in us that God could accept. Not a thing. And yet God allowed it, and God desired it. And I know he desired it because if he didn't desire it, he would have kept it from happening. Why did God allow the whole thing to happen? So that he could redeem us. This is the only way we can have the righteousness of God and Christ possess us forever. Christ could have possessed Adam, but in what state? Just in that earthly state. Y'all see the wonderful plan of God? It, it's, it's, it, it blows my mind the more I study. Okay, any questions or anything? Wow. Alright, well thank y'all very much.